In this lecture, we explore civic cults whose ceremonies took place publicly. Worship of Athena in Athens will serve as our example. We will then visit Demeter both in Athens and at Eleusis, a small town not far from Athens, as well as Dionysus, whose worship spread not just in Greece, but also to Italy and beyond. And through these visitations, discover the world of mystery religions, cults that required secret initiation away from the prying and profane eyes of the public. The sometimes vaunted patience or tolerance of the polytheistic state, as we shall see, did not always permit, and sometimes even persecuted, such worshipers, especially those who followed Dionysus, the god of intoxication. But first, Athena Polias in the city of Athens. Athena earned her epithet Polias when she became the patron goddess of the polis, or city. This occurred, according to myth, when Erichthonius, also called Erechtheus, decided a contest between Athena and Poseidon. When the two of them vied for precedence, Athena offered the olive, Poseidon, salt water. Erichthonius, the judge, who chose the olive, and thus Athena, could also claim partial descent from the virgin goddess, despite her virginity. Erichthonius' father, Hephaestus, god of the forge, attempted to rape Athena. He was unsuccessful, but during the assault, he ejaculated on Athena's leg. I agree, this is grotesque and distasteful, but to continue, the semen fell to the ground and Erichthonius was conceived in the earth. Gay, with a hard G in Greek. But in English, we pronounce a G followed by E as G, as in geology, geography, geothermal. Gay was a goddess in her own right. Even dirt is divine. Athena took this child, conceived in violence and shame, hid him in a box, and entrusted the box to the daughters of Kecrops. Kecrops was then king of Athens. She gave them instructions not to look inside. But are you surprised? Kecrops' daughters peaked. To their horror and to their destruction, they discovered a remarkably beautiful child surrounded by vicious serpents. Erichthonius survived. The daughters of Kecrops did not. Erichthonius subsequently grew up in Athena's temple and became king after Kecrops. Poseidon, I fear, never had a chance in that contest, and Athena became Athena Polias, that is, city Athena of Athens. Erichthonius also established, according to legend, the Pan-Athenaic Festival, the festival of all Athens, a yearly celebration of Athena's birthday on the 28th of Hecatombion, a month that fell somewhere between July and August. This was a hot time of year, which is perhaps why preliminary festivities began in the evening, beforehand, with all-night singing and dance performances by choruses of girls and boys. This was the Panikis, literally the all-nighter. And dawn was only the midpoint, as the festival proper began with daybreak. The pan Athenia proper was celebrated in two varieties, a smaller or lesser, and a larger or greater. The lesser version of the pan Athenia was celebrated annually for three years. And every fourth year, a greater pan Athenia subsumed the activities of the lesser pan Athenia by adding days for pre preliminary contests. The ancient Greeks were a notoriously competitive people, so festivities included musical contests, poetry recitations, gymnastic contests, horse and chariot racing, Pyrrhic dances. Pyrrhic dances, we may note in passing, were a sort of war dance performed by naked men who wore nothing more than a helmet on their heads and a shield on their left arm. Athena may have been a virgin goddess, but she was also a fierce goddess of war. Nakedness did not carry the same shame among ancient Greeks that it has among monotheistic religions. And on the day following the festival, there was a supplementary boat race. These contests could, for the lesser Pan-Athenia, be squeezed into a day or two. 
For the greater Panathenia, the contest could stretch on for three days or more. All these contests were, like the nocturnal choruses of the Panicus, preliminary, and they served to determine who would lead the main event on the 28th of Hecatombion, Athena's birthday. Indeed, exciting as all these events must have been, the centerpiece of the festival was a lavish parade, or to phrase it more solemnly, a procession, followed by animal sacrifices of cows, bulls, sheep, and rams, with subsequent feasting on sacrificial meat, which was distributed according to deems or district. But before we feast, let's look at the parade, which was depicted on the Parthenon, and which we may now find in the remains of the frieze on the exterior wall of the Naos, that is, the portion of the temple that enclosed the statue of Athena. This low-relief frieze, in the traditional interpretation, depicts the stages of the procession, as well as the people who marched. On the west end, we observe riders preparing their horses. If we proceed from the west toward the east, we observe riders on their horses, a chariot race, old men, musicians, porters, and sacrificial animals. The north side features water bearers, sheep, and cattle. The south side, tablet bearers and cattle. On the east side, we observe girls, heroes, gods, and a new cloak, or peplos, for Athena. The images from the Parthenon friezes, one may view the dubiously obtained originals in the British Museum, give us an idea of the Panathenia, again, according to their traditional interpretation. But we cannot expect them to give us exact details. And to cast further shade on these illustrations, a recent interpretation argues that they pertain not so much to Athena as to Erichthonius. But time is too short for that. Let us turn to literary reports from ancient authors who can help us imagine the details. We are told that the whole population turned out for the procession, citizens and resident aliens alike. Though I note that slaves are not mentioned, so perhaps it was just the whole free population. The victors of the various contests led the way, followed by sacrificial officiants, officers of the army, dignitaries who had reached old age, young men, and, this is noteworthy, dear students of gender relations, many girls and women who escaped the confines of the house for this religious occasion. They carried baskets, and it was the women's job to manufacture each year the new peplos, or cloak, for Athena. This job, too, took women out of the house, as a peplos could not be manufactured in a few hours or even a few days. Religion, sanctioned civic religion, granted women opportunities to escape the confines of the domestic sphere and the annual festival of the Panathenia was not the only such occasion that offered this opportunity. Women served as priestesses of local gods, visited shrines of Asclepius in hopes of cures, and enjoyed some forms of worship which were exclusively reserved for women. The greatest example of exclusively female worship is the Thesmophoria, which, had, which was a three-day festival in honor of Demeter, goddess of grain. But goddess of grain fails to capture the reverence in which Demeter was held. The ancient historian Diodorus tells us that Demeter's gift is what makes human life possible at all. Athena protected, Demeter granted life itself. She was also a model mother, but more on that in a moment. To prepare for Demeter's worship, upper-class women to whom the rites were confined, and perhaps only married women, abstained from sexual relations for nine days, and possibly resorted to special herbs to reduce sexual desires, at least according to our male sources. The three-day festival consisted of three days away from home, camping on the ground, and began with a nocturnal procession, during which the women sang lewd songs and made obscene comments. Obscenity, we may note, was, like nakedness, tolerated, if not enjoyed, in certain religious contexts. If the comedies of Aristophanes are any guide, the gods even tolerated a satirical roast at their expense. 
three days away from the strictures of the women's quarters at home were probably a welcome respite. The rituals were kept secret. But in addition to the camping, we hear of sacrifices that included throwing pigs into chasms. One would like to know more. Ancient male authors offered guesses, just as they offered guesses about other exclusively female rites. But the secrets of the Thesmophoria remain well kept. Remarkably, the Eleusinian mysteries of Demeter, which were open to both men and women, also remain hidden. Despite the many thousands who were initiated over the centuries, no clear account has come down to us. Demeter was the mother of Persephone, who was also known as Cora, the maiden. Persephone was captured by Hades to serve as his wife in the underworld. And when Persephone went missing, a distraught Demeter searched for her daughter until she learned her daughter's fate. After that, Demeter was grief-stricken and angry. The Roman poet Ovid describes the scene. The goddess tore her unkempt locks and smote her breast again and again with her hands. She did not know as yet where her child was. Still, she reproached all lands, calling them ungrateful and unworthy of the gift of grain. So there, with angry hand, she broke in pieces the plows that turned the earth, and in her rage she gave to destruction farmers and cattle alike, and bade the plowed fields to betray their trust, and blighted the seed. The fertility of this land, famous throughout the world, lay false to its good name. The crops died in early blade, now too much heat, now too much rain, destroying them. Stars and winds were baleful, and greedy birds ate up the seed as soon as it was sown. Tares and thorns and stubborn grasses choked the wheat. To make a long story short, Demeter eventually convinced Zeus to compel his brother to return Persephone. Alas, Persephone had eaten some pomegranate seeds while in the underworld, so she was each year compelled to remain as many months below the earth as she had eaten seeds. When Persephone is above the earth with her mother, Demeter is full of joy and blesses the earth with fertility. When the daughter is with Hades below the earth, her mother mourns and nothing grows. This explains the seasons and provides the backdrop to the mysteries that took place originally only at Demeter's sanctuary in Eleusis. Although initiation was open to both citizens and foreigners, one could not simply show up at the beginning of the annual 10-day festival in September. A would-be initiate had to arrive early and make arrangements. Initiates had to find an instructor or Mr. Gogos who had already been initiated. The Mr. Gogos would test the votary for fitness and present the applicant to the priest or hierophant. Preparations included fasting during the daytime, eating only at night, abstaining from certain foods, including, of course, pomegranates, but also beans. At the beginning of the festival, votaries gathered at sunset and proceeded on foot to the sea, where they would bathe. On the days that followed, there were sacrifices, all-night vigils that also went by the name Panikis. And eventually, a trek on foot to Eleusis, which, if done efficiently, would take about four hours to cover 11 miles, but generally took much longer. Did the fasting, the all-night vigils, have a psychological effect? One can imagine. When the night for initiation came, before being allowed to enter, the initiate said, according to the Christian author Clement of Alexandria, I fasted, I drank the potion, consisting of barley, cheese, wine, and magical drugs. I took from the chest, having done my task, I have placed in the basket, and from the basket into the chest. The initiate was, the initiate was then, we are told, instructed in what happened to Persephone and learned things from the priest that could not be repeated. In fact, divulging the mysteries of Persephone was punishable by death, and we have accounts of people who were brought up on charges, including the tragedian Aeschylus, who was acquitted of having divulged the mysteries in his plays. 
The highest grade of initiation came a year later when it was possible to see the sacred objects, whatever they may have been. Ancient Christian authors have left some guesses for our consideration. Clement of Alexandria writes, I must strip bare their holy things and utter the unspeakable. Are these sacred objects not sesame cakes, pyramid and spherical cakes, cakes with many navels, also bowls of salt and a serpent, the mystic sign of Dionysus, Basarius? Are they not also pomegranates, fig branches, fennel stalks, ivy leaves, round cakes, and poppies? These are their holy things. In addition, there are the unutterable symbols of gay themis, marjoram, a lamp, a sword, and a woman's comb, which is a euphemistic expression used in the mysteries for a woman's secret parts. What manifest shamelessness. So, female genitalia, according to the outraged ancient Christian father, were the most sacred object. A grain stalk is another and more sober guess at the most sacred object. Whatever the objects may have been, the sun shone brighter for the initiates, and they spoke of a greater peace and understanding about what lay in the next world after their earthly life came to an end. And this makes sense. Persephone could offer assistance when the, when the deceased entered Hades. Despite the attempts of Christian emperors to shut down Eleusis, the mysteries remained popular until 394 CE, when the sanctuary was destroyed by a barbarian invasion. Another mystery religion that attracted the attention, not just of Christian moralists, but also the state authorities of the pre-Christian world, was the worship of Dionysus, the god of wine and intoxication. His mysteries, too, are worth a look. Dionysus, the Romans called him Bacchus or Liber, was the son of Zeus. His mother, Semele, was mortal and had been tricked by Hera, who disguised herself as a friendly old woman, into asking Zeus to make love to her the way he did to Hera. Semele cajoled Zeus to do just that. Alas, Zeus, in all his glory, is a thunderbolt. Semele died in a flash of lightning. She died, but Zeus, but Zeus saved the sun in her womb by sewing him up in his thigh until the fetus came to term. Dionysus, because he was born not just from a mortal woman's womb, but was also born again from Zeus's thigh, was immortal. He was the twice-born god, and he introduced, according to myth, the cultivation of the vine, that is, grapes, viticulture, the raw materials for wine. Dionysus was also a jealous god and persecuted those who refused to worship him. Our most famous representation of Dionysus derives from the tragedy of Euripides, the Bacchae, which was produced in 405 BCE the year before Euripides died. When the tragedy opens, Bacchus, as he is frequently called in the play, is traveling through Greece to make himself known as the son of Zeus. But upon reaching his mother's hometown of Thebes, Bacchus encounters skeptics who deny his divinity. His mother's sister, Agave, does not believe that Bacchus is a god, nor does Agave's son, Pentheus, the current king of Thebes. Bacchus has driven the women of Thebes into a frenzy and forced them to worship him, and they celebrate his rites on Mount Scytheron. Pentheus is outraged and completely hostile to the new religion. In the time of Euripides, the worship of Bacchus was a long-established and accepted addition to the worship of the gods. This seems not always to have been the case. According to myth, when Bacchus came back to Greece, he had to struggle to establish his new religion. Cadmus, former king of Thebes, father of Bacchus's mother Semele, and father of Pentheus's mother Agave, warns Pentheus. The blind prophet Tiresias warns Pentheus as well. Pentheus does not listen to the warnings of his grandfather or of the prophet, and he attempts to imprison Bacchus who claims to be only a worshiper of Bacchus. Bacchus, however, 
blinds Pentheus to reality. Pentheus ties up a bull instead of Bacchus. Bacchus then sends an earthquake to destroy Pentheus' palace. Meanwhile, a messenger arrives with news of what the frenzied women are up to on Mount Scytheron. Pentheus is not pleased by what he hears. Bacchus then tricks Pentheus into dressing up like a woman so that he can go see for himself what the women are doing. Once Pentheus is on the mountain, Bacchus makes sure that the women catch sight of Pentheus. The women tear Pentheus to pieces. Agave, still frenzied, carries the head of her own son in triumph to town. Women who worshipped Bacchus were called maenads. They were often depicted carrying a long stick or fennel stalk topped with ivy. This was the thyrsus, and their rites included not only gathering in an all-female group, only women could be maenads. If a group included both men and women, it was a theosos. They preferred to gather in remote mountain spots for wild dancing, or abasia, but also ripping wild animals to pieces and then eating the flesh of these wild animals raw. They imagined that the god was himself mystically present in the animal. This was the so-called pleasure of eating raw flesh, or omophagus charis. Greek vases depict for us maenads in a state of frenzy, as well as mixed groups of worshippers in a theosos. Fennel stalks are thirsty in hand. As this brief sketch may show, worship of Bacchus was, at least according to the myth, perceived as a threat to male control over religious practice. Women removed themselves from the city and participated in emotional rituals removed from the male gaze and male control. Pantheus himself remarks how shameful it is for the men of Thebes that their women engage in such practices. One did more than tell stories about Bacchus in antiquity. He was worshipped with real and sometimes extravagant rites. In many places, his worship also differed from the calmer worship of of the gods of Olympus, consisting in the sacrifice of animals by state priests. Athens, however, eventually incorporated worship of Dionysus into its yearly schedule of festivals, and thus provides an example of how cities tamed him, so to speak. Indeed, a state that had numerous gods could always adopt additional gods, and most states tolerated numerous other gods if worshippers stayed out of trouble. But the state did not always tolerate all gods indiscriminately. And mystery cults sometimes came under suspicion, especially those which, like the worship of Dionysus, brought women out of the house at night for wine drinking and wild dancing without male supervision. As we shall soon see, looking ahead to Rome, even after Dionysus had been tamed in Greece, Bacchic worship could still upset polytheists elsewhere. But what was the advantage of joining such a non-state cult? The advantages, according to the cults themselves, were many, including fertility in this world and assistance in the next world. Cult initiates received help from the god of the cult when facing the judges of the underworld. An afterlife, let alone eternal bliss, was not guaranteed by state gods. Cult gods, on the other hand, like Bacchus, because he had been born once of a mortal woman and then a second time into eternal life as an immortal god, could help an individual fix things in the next world, but only if the individual were a properly initiated member of his cult. There were also advantages in this world which were not inconsiderable and which we have already mentioned wild mountain dancing, raw animal flesh, and wine, that is, alcohol, intoxication. In mixed gatherings in the Theosos, this could lead to sex, which is not to say that sex could not have occurred at same-sex gatherings as well, and sometimes violence. There is, for example, archaeological evidence that suggests ritual whipping for purification. Wall paintings from Pompeii seem to illustrate this, but this is not certain. State cults gave citizens membership in the civic body. 
Mystery religions gave people membership in a personal cult, that is, a cult that addressed individual and personal needs. Participation in the cult in this world allowed one to transcend normal life. One experienced a temporary membership within a community of fellow worshippers, bringing a potentially blissful feeling of belonging. Altogether, a rather attractive package. Why did the state sometimes object? Women who were citizens and had sex outside marriage threatened property relations, which descended patrilineally. And gatherings without proper supervision were tantamount to political conspiracy. And in 186 BCE, the Roman state outlawed the worship of Bacchus for these very reasons. Hundreds of, or perhaps thousands of worshippers were crucified along the roads leading to Rome. Despite these efforts, the Roman state too, however, eventually abandoned its struggle against the followers of Bacchus, and a milder version of the worship of Bacchus was accommodated in Rome. Earlier in this century, scholars often compared mystery cults with Christianity. Christianity requires initiation, baptism. The initiate becomes a member of a community of fellow believers and abandons other groups and forms of worship. Additionally, early Christians met at night and drank wine. These were all-night prayer vigils with communion. Christians were also, like worshippers of Bacchus before them, also accused of cannibalism, ritual murder, intoxication, illicit sex, and political conspiracy. Another similarity was the promise of help in the afterlife. Current scholarship, nevertheless, tends to reject the similarity of Christianity with ancient mystery religions for two reasons. Scholars who made the comparison often had a hidden agenda. They wanted to attack the uniqueness of Christian and Jewish monotheism. Also, mystery religions varied from city to city and were often integrated with the many other gods of antiquity. Much scholarship failed to appreciate these differences. The question of how unique Jewish monotheism and Christianity may have been, we shall postpone for the future. Because we, dear students, have run out of time. What have we done? We have looked at the civic cult of Athenopolis in Athens, the exclusively female worship of Demeter at the Thesmophoria, the mysteries of Demeter at Eleusis, and the perceived threats of Dionysus and Bacchic worship. In all these forms of worship, we see, too, that there were opportunities for women to form communities among women, as well as some opportunities for mixed groups to form communities apart from their families and the state. Initiation into mystery religions could also assist individuals on the lonely journeys they faced into the next world when they died. But there is still more. In our next lecture, we'll look at Orpheus, who harrowed hell in search of his wife, and then returned to preach same-sex love to men. We'll also discuss the doctrines of some early skeptics who rejected the beliefs and practices of their fellow citizens and kinsmen, sometimes at the cost of their lives. Until then, dear disciples of ancient religions and cult practices, may your days be auspicious, your nights restful, and your health excellent. <laughs>